Okay, so next up, we want to focus specifically on some of the challenges and nuances of dealing with uh, the insurance company specifically. Um, and there's some, a lot of technical information, and we have uh, probably the foremost expert on this technical <laughs> side of this thing right here with us tonight, um, and that's uh, Ray Boris. So, thank you. Please go ahead. Hi. Okay, first off, I want to make sure that everyone knows um, Suzanne McCafferty. So, Suzanne, raise your hand. She is the person who you can go to. She's like a walking Rolodex, and she knows everybody. And she can help you find what you need to find when you need to find it. Um, obviously, um, this is a situation that everybody would rather not have, be having this experience with. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so sorry for all of you who have suffered loss. I was one of the luckier ones. I, I was mandatorily evacuated. My house is on El Bosque Road. Uh, but I didn't have substantial damage to my home. My neighbors did, some of whom are here tonight. Um, someone told me recently that the insurance company's worst nightmare when something like this happens is to learn that Ray Boris is living in the neighborhood. <laughs> and that, that was, it was nice for them to say, but in this case, um, I think the worst nightmare is that this happened in Montecito because this is a hell of a community. And the people are smart, they're honest, they're straight shooters, and they're not gonna roll over just because some billion dollar insurance company decides that that's what they should do. So I'm gonna try to do all I can to help you, help yourself, and the first thing I would like you to do is to write down uh, a place where you can get two articles that I wrote recently. One of them lists 15 things that you should do to protect yourself uh, and, and how you should go about presenting a claim. And where you go is to R. F. Boris, R like Ray, F like Francois Boris, B-O-U-R-H-I-S at gmail.com. And I will send you those two articles, and I think uh, you should read them for sure, please. Uh, you don't have to be an insurance coverage expert to file an insurance claim. You don't have to know the ins and outs of every aspect of your policy. But knowledge is power. And the more you know, the stronger you are. There's no question about that. That's what I have seen time and time again over the 40 years that I've been suing insurance companies or negotiating with insurance companies to settle claims on behalf of my clients. The insurance companies treat you very differently when you know what you're talking about than they do when they can take advantage of you. If you stumble and there are things that you need extra help on, you can send me an email. I'll do my best to respond to anybody and everybody that has a question. Um, but let me just give you three fast examples uh, today of ways that insurance companies are writing these policies. I swear, they must have a contest to see who can write the most obtuse, incomprehensible language known to mankind. You may as well, no offense to the Chinese people, but you may as well write them in Chinese because when you read some of these provisions in the insurance policies, they go like this. What's covered on page one is modified on page seven, is excluded on page 10, and is limited on page 14. So you wind up scratching your head, and that's, again, no accident. The insurance companies, some insurance companies at least, are smart enough to know that the more confused you are, the more money they keep in their bank and out of your hands. And that's the sad reality of the way that this game works. And it is a game to, the, to some insurance companies. Um, I'll give you two examples, first of all. One of them is Howell versus State Farm. Starting, I don't know, a week or two ago, I ran across an article, an op-ed article in the Los Angeles Times written by a law professor, of all things, 
from San Diego in which he was basically telling people, you should file a claim under your flood insurance policy and I hope you have flood insurance because you're probably not going to get anywhere on your homeowner's insurance because homeowner's insurance has exclusions and limitations in big letters, and they do. We do not insure for flooding, land movement, earth movement, on and on and on. We do not insure for that. And the insurance companies would have you believe that they can enforce that, or they, at least they can bargain, they can use it to bargain from. No. No, that's not true. So I got on the telephone and I called, I was, managed to somehow get through, just by being persistent, to the editor of the, uh, of the letters to the editor page of the Los Angeles Times. And I said, look, I'm sure you guys didn't realize what you were doing here, but you printed a bunch of incorrect information and I'm afraid the people in Montecito are going to read the LA Times and rely on what you're telling them, and it's not correct. Oh, yes it is. No, it's not. So I said, look, do yourself a favor and read Howell versus State Farm. Go on your little computer and look it up, and I'll call you back in five minutes. I call him back in five minutes, and the guy goes, oh boy, okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, he saw what I was saying. And State Farm saw what I was saying, the defendant in that case. And State Farm has wound up saying, okay, there is coverage on a homeowner's insurance policy. You do not have to have flood insurance. You're going to be covered under your homeowner's policy. Why? Because the court, the, the, you're, we're all lucky to be living in California. We have better courts in California that are more consumer oriented and more protective of people like us than um, any other state in the United States. Bar none. This is, uh, California is in, a, is in a class by itself. There's a whole line of cases, starting with Garvey and going on, four or five other cases, and ending with this Howell versus State Farm case. And what it says is very simple. Your exclusions in your insurance policy are void. They are meaningless. You cannot rely on them, Mr. Insurance Company, no. Not if the reason for the flood is not just a lot of rain, not just because of an overflow from a, a, a river, not connected with anything else. If the reason for the flood is an underlying cause that is covered by your insurance, namely a fire, you gotta pay. And that's what I wrote in a letter to the editor responsive to this op-ed piece, they printed it the next day. The, the um, uh, newspaper here in Santa Barbara, the news press, had a front page story on it, and all of a sudden things started to change, and people were going, oh yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah maybe there is coverage for this. Oh, I'll take a look at it, we'll take a look at it. So a couple of days ago I wrote a letter to 15 or 20, uh, Suzanne, I don't remember how many, but a whole bunch of other insurance companies basically very politely, respectfully, throwing down the gauntlet and saying, would you please acknowledge that there is coverage in Montecito for the flood damage and the debris flow because it was caused by the fire. I suspect that by the time all is said and done, they're all gonna fall in line with that. Maybe some lawyers are not gonna be so happy about it because those lawsuits, which would have been multi-million dollar lawsuits, are gonna go away. The insurance companies, if they're smart, are going to say, you know what? This guy's saving us a lot of money in the long run. He's right. And that's what we should do, and that's what we're going to do. I'm hoping that they all fall in line. If they don't, what can I say? We'll see. We'll see what will happen then. But that's the one example. The second example is kind of a minor example, but it says a lot. And that is the issue of additional living expense. Um, my insurance company told me that because it was a mandatory evacuation that I was limited to two weeks of um, additional living expense that I, that's all I could get. So I said, can I please speak to the claims manager? Well, I don't think he's available. You tell me he should be available. Tell him Ray Boris would like to talk to him, pretty please. The claims manager comes on the telephone and he said, you know what? Take a look at your policy. Here's what it says under additional living expense. If a loss covered under section one, that is the, the fire and the flood, makes 
uh, part of the residence premises where you reside not fit to live in. Not fit to live in. Doesn't say that it has to be destroyed. Doesn't say that it has to be on fire. Not fit to live in. We cover any necessary increase in living expenses incurred by you so that your household can maintain its normal standard of living. Period. You go down further on that same page, what does it say? If a civil authority prohibits you from use of the residence premises as a result of direct damage to the neighboring premises by a peril insured against, we cover the loss as provided in one additional living expense above uh, or two, fair rental value above, uh, above as well, but for no more than two weeks. Now, I defy anybody to tell me what the difference is between a loss to the residence premises that makes the property uninhabitable or uh, causes it to be uh, uh, unfit and, and uh, a situation where the civil authorities say it's a mandatory vac evacuation, get out. There is no difference. The only possible explanation for that provision in the policy would be a situation where there's a false alarm, where there's a mandatory evacuation and no damage occurs. Nothing happens. So you don't have problems with your utilities, you don't have problems with your water, you don't have problems driving to your property because the roads are under four feet of debris, you don't have problems with anything else that would make the house uninhabitable. The insurance companies would love it if we would all go, okay, thanks very much, we'll take the two weeks, and we'll thank our lucky stars that you're so kind to give us this money. No, you have unlimited additional living expense subject only to the declarations of your insurance policy, which is usually in the at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if anybody has a problem with that, that's the answer to your problem. With regard to the other section that I wanted, and I, I wish I had time to go through the, these policies line by line, because I'm an insurance nerd. You know, I enjoy this stuff. It's like a game to me to beat the insurance companies at their own, at their own game. And I learned very early on um, that it was like shooting fish in a barrel sometimes. Because the insurance companies, they don't have mean claims adjusters, as I have said before, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to settle any claims. And they don't have mean agents that sell the insurance policies, or they wouldn't be able to sell any policies. These are nice people. They're just very careful not to give them information that they don't want them to have. So they don't tell them that any exclusion in the policy um, uh, that is vague and ambiguous has to be interpreted in favor of the policyholder, because if they don't tell the claims adjuster that he doesn't know it or she doesn't know it, and if they don't know it, then they can't apply that to the interpretation of their policy. There are five or six other rules of construction that apply to uh, uh, the interpretation of insurance policies. All of them in California favor you all of them do not favor the insurance companies. So I've, I've got articles I've written on that as well, and I'll be happy to send I can see that I'm gonna get the hook, am I right? <laughs> well, no, you've gotta use the hook, otherwise I'll just go on forever. You can tell I'll be here for, until the sun comes up. Um, and, I, I, and I would probably violate a promise that I made earlier that I was not, not gonna tell any war stories, because I love war stories. Um, but I'm not gonna tell any. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell war stories after, the, after we're all done, if any of you want to hear some. Um, the, the issue under a personal property inventory is important, and this is one of the things, one of the 15 things you will read when you look at this article. I'll tell you how to do it, okay? People screw up on this all the time, innocently, because they don't realize exactly what is required of them. Under most insurance policies, they have to give you replacement value for everything, not depreciated value. In some policies, you have to actually replace something before the obligation is imposed on the insurance company to pay that value. But if you replace it, they have to give you that value. What difference does that make? You multiply all of the things that you have in your house, all of the electronics, all of the appliances, all of the uh, television, video equipment, everything else that you have, antiques perhaps, beds, dining room tables, chairs, clothes, on and on and on. That is going to come, it will surprise most of you if you haven't done it already, to see how much money 
it, that comes to it, what it's going to cost to replace that. Insurance company would love to say, oh, well, uh, how long have you had this dining room table? Well, I have had it for 12 years. And what did you pay for it originally? Oh, I've, you know, around $3,000 or something like that. It's an antique, you know. Yeah, well, okay. Well, you've had it for 10 years. You probably have, if you had to depreciate it, what would you say, like 50%, 60%? We'll pay you, we'll pay you 50% of the value of it. Wrong. That table is probably worth three times what you paid for it if it's an antique. And the same thing is true for so many other things in your home. Your television set is not worth much on it anymore because you can't sell it because nobody wants to buy a used television set. So the insurance company loves to say, it's not worth anything, it's worth very little. Uh-uh, you are entitled to recover what it costs you to replace that. Same thing with your stereo equipment, same thing with everything else in your house. Um, that, that, that's just a, a fast uh, summary of the, of, of, of the personal property inventory aspect of this. The dwelling protection aspect is what goes on for 44 pages in your insurance policy. Please don't think that I am telling you you have to become a coverage expert. Insurance companies actually will send out for a coverage opinion their own policy that the insurance company wrote to one of their mega in, in, uh, law firms that they have all over the country in every city and, and, and town in America. They've got 500 person law firms. They send it out for a coverage opinion. What? They wrote the policy. What do they need a coverage opinion, opinion for? Because they don't know what the policy means. The courts know what the policies mean. Lawyers, a handful of lawyers know what the policies mean, but the insurance companies often do not. So I'm going to shut up now. I'm, I, I, I can tell. I'm getting in trouble. Okay.